On March 12th, this week, I celebrated 14 years of being the senior pastor of Calvary Church. Now, if, <laughs> now if you had asked me 14 years ago what one of my greatest fears was, one of them would have been that someday I would be preaching to an empty sanctuary. <laughs> and yet here we are. But that's the amazing thing about our worst fears is that when you're a Christian and when God is with you, when and if your worst fear happens, it's different than you thought it was going to be. Because God's with you. And the thing we can't project when we project out our fears is what God is going to be doing at that time. And if God forbid we end up through this virus or through whatever, at some of our worst fears, the good news is, is whatever we're thinking it's going to be like, it won't be like that. Because we'll be different and God will be with us. And when it happens, we'll look around and say, yeah, this was the thing that I was afraid of. But God is still on the throne. He's still good. He's still present. And you know what? It looks and feels different than I thought it would. So now <clears throat> for housekeeping, for those of you who are watching at home, Tom said we'd like you to participate with us in communion. You might be thinking, I don't have any grape juice. I don't have any crackers. How am I gonna do that? Super easy. Find some kind of bread product. Uh, it can be uh, sandwich bread. It can be crackers. The great thing about the Lord is he is not a legalist. And so find something. And then any kind of juice product you got. Orange juice, grape juice is fantastic. Apple juice, you don't have juice, you can use Coke. You can use Pepsi, you can use Sprite. You got nothing, a glass of water will be just fine. And so when we get to the time of communion, uh, we would, we'd love for us all collectively uh, to take it together. Uh, there's something about the fact that we are one body because we partake of one bread and take communion together. And so if at some point you need to go into the kitchen and get something, get something prepared, there will be some time at the end of the sermon for you to get ready for that, but I just want you to think through how to do that. All right, let's pray together. Father, as I said, we've come to this time into this season, and Lord, uh, it's different than we expected it to be. This is not how I expected this Sunday to be going. Lord, I know that there are people all around this city, all around this country, all around this world who are not expecting things to be going the way they are right now. Lord, I want to begin by praying for President Trump, uh, for our governor here in the state of Michigan, for the Centers for Disease Control, Lord, for those who are staffing hospitals, doctors, nurses, others who are working in the healthcare professions, many of whom are working long, long hours. Lord, I pray for those who are in charge and making decisions. God, please give them wisdom. Uh, Lord, give them understanding. Thank you, Lord, for the vigilance about people wanting to protect us from disease. I do pray, Lord, in the midst of this, that we would not think of ourselves, nor would they think of us as simply disease carriers. We are humans made in the image of God. And so, Lord, you know that we need more than just protection from illness. We need community. We need life. Uh, Lord, we need laughter. We need words from you. Man does not live on health care alone, but on every word that proceeds out of your mouth. And so God, for all of those who are in the front lines, all of those who are engaged, Lord, for those who are sick, for those who are scared, Lord, for churches around this country and around this world, some of whom don't have video capabilities, some of whom are not able to meet, Lord, others are not sure what to do. Lord, I praise you uh, that when you said, Jesus, that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church, that sickness, government, disease, problems, economics, nothing will stop you. And so, Lord, as we open your word, we pray that you would give us understanding. God, I pray uh, you said that we're in some ways we preach to an audience of one and that, God, you are watching. And so, Lord, I pray that in our behavior, in our actions, in our interactions, Lord, that you would allow us, uh, God, to feel your presence. Lord, may your spirit be near to us during this time. God, what better thing could any one of us have than for you to speak to us through your word, through communion, through prayer? 
And Lord, for the brokenhearted, for the shut-in, Lord, for the family that is alone, for the people who are scared, Lord, if you speak, if you're present, if you're nearby, what else could we ask for? So God, in your mercy and in your grace, be near to us. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, six imaginary scenarios I'd like you to think through with me. Number one, imagine the Chick-fil-A lover. This is the person who eats at Chick-fil-A at least once or twice a week, absolutely loves eating there. The person who, when the new store is opening in town, wanted to be one of the first hundred people in the store to get free Chick-fil-A for the year. And so they camped out all night in the winter and in the cold so that they could be one of the first hundred people. Scenario number two, the University of Michigan super fan. This is the person who has not missed any home games, has seen every football game for the past 30 years, bleeds maize and blue. They've even named their dog Harbaugh out of respect for the coach. Situation number three, the helicopter parent. Super engaged and involved in their kids' lives. They're there at every event, has not missed a single sporting event or extracurricular event that their child has been involved in knows exactly what their grades are at every moment of every day, involved and engaged, always talking with them, their kids, about what's going on in their life. Scenario or situation number four, the fire person. And by fire, I mean financial independence, retire early. This is the person who has made up their mind uh, that they are going to save 50 to 70% of their income and they are vigorous and engaged in doing this. They love it actually. They love saving as much money as possible. They're spending as little as possible and they're all in on trying to be financially independent as soon as possible. Scenario number five. This is the employee of the month who is employee of the month every month. They love work. They're there all the time. They're fully engaged. They have not taken their full allotment of vacation days in 10 years. They talk about work all the time. They're an excellent, amazing employee. Their workplace loves them. Scenario number six. This is uh, a junior in high school who has set their mind to getting accepted to an Ivy League school. They are engaged in every honors class, every AP class that you can take. They're doing all the extra credit possible. They're involved in every extracurricular activity. Any free time they have, they're using to prepare for standardized tests. They are set on going to an Ivy League school. What word might you use to describe such people? Well, a word that I would use is passionate. They're passionate about those things. They're passionate about their food. They're passionate about their University of Michigan football. They're passionate about work. They're passionate about their children. They're passionate about financial independence. They're passionate about getting into a good academic college. We might also use the word focused. They're focused on what they're doing. We could even use the word driven. They're driven to accomplish these things. And there's much about those six scenarios that we can actually find commendable. But the reason I ask you to think through those six situations is because it's possible that in those six situations, and we might resonate with different ones, and again, you can swap in or swap out other things like iPhones or coffee or exercise or whatever it may be. There may be things in our lives that we are passionate about, that we are driven or focused on, but there might be a biblical character trait that such people are overlooking. 
There might be something that God values that we might be missing. So if you will, I ask you to take a Bible and turn to the book of Titus chapter two. Titus chapter two. If you need a church Bible, there's one in the rack in front of you. You might have selectively borrowed one from the church and taken it home. It's page 966 in those Bibles. If you have a different Bible, I have no idea what page it's on, but I'll give you just a minute or two to turn to Titus chapter two. Titus chapter two, and we're going to talk about a character trait that might be undervalued and overlooked in our society today. We've been going, as you know, through the book of Titus as a church this year, and we've been doing topical series in the book of Titus. In reality, it's not been one long series, it's really four mini-series. The first mini-series we did came out of Titus chapter one, and these we talked about particular topics that were raised through that chapter, topics like food, alcohol, time, hospitality, parenting, and our goal was to look at what God has to say about each of those topics. The purpose for Titus and the purpose for us studying it together as a church is because so much of our world feels out of control, and all the more this week, doesn't it? Because it feels out of control, God wants to bring his control of all things into our lives. And that's the purpose of the book of Titus. And so we first talked about this kind of mini series about, well, how does God think about food? What does God think about hospitality? What does God think about parenting? So that God's thoughts can control our thoughts and actions in those areas. The second mini series that we were doing out of the book of Titus, this came out of Titus chapter two, verse one in which it says, you, however, much teach, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. And we just finished a series in which we went through basic Bible doctrines. We talked about creation, election, redemption, Messiah, exile, incarnation, resurrection, spirit, and kingdom. And the reason we did that is not only can things be out of control when it comes to food or time, things can be out of control in our minds and how we think about life. And so God says, help think about things correctly. This morning, we're beginning this third mini-series in the book of Titus, and it comes from the rest of Titus chapter two. And there's a verse that kind of summarizes what this third mini-series is all about. It comes not out of the book of Titus. It comes out of the book of Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse 17. Ecclesiastes says, the quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. And the idea of what Titus 2 verses 2 and following are talking about is what you might describe as the quiet life. Quiet virtues and qualities, quiet activities, quiet in the sense of our culture may not pay much attention to them. They may not be showy or noticed, but they are incredibly valuable to God. They're an important part of his kingdom. And he longs for us to have these character qualities and activities in our lives so that God's control of all things can be experienced in our lives today. And so for over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about some of the quieter things, some of the things while the world is shouting, God is quietly whispering, hey, pay attention. These are the character traits. These are the activities that cause us to live godly, dignified, disciplined, holy lives in the midst of a world that is spinning out of control. And to be honest, I had no idea how much it was going to feel like it was spinning out of control back in September when we started this series, but the Lord knew. 
And if there's any book of the Bible that God has chosen for Calvary Church as we go through this coronavirus issue, it's the book of Titus because he wants us to live self-controlled, godly, upright lives in the midst of a world in which God is still in control, but it feels like everything is spiraling out of control. So let me read for us Titus 2, verses 2 to 10, and then we're going to talk through this important character quality trait that we've been alluding to this morning. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Now the quality we want to talk about this morning is actually the first quality listed in this passage, but it's a close sister to the third quality that's listed, which also happens to be the one that is mentioned most often in chapter 2 and most often in the book of Titus. The first quality is in verse two, and it's the word temperate. Do you see the word temperate? If you look over past worthy of respect, you'll see the third quality. This is the one mentioned most often in the book of Titus, and it is the word self-controlled. And so what we're going to be talking about as we begin this series is these two concepts, which are essentially the same idea, temperance, and self-control. Now I want you to think back with me to those six scenarios that we talked about. The person who loves Chick-fil-A, the person who's passionate about University of Michigan football, the parent who's super engaged and involved with their kids' lives, uh, the person who is financially independent, wanting to retire early, the person who's employee of the month every month, and the person who is fighting vigorously to get into a super academic school. Now, while we might use the word passionate, driven, focused about such people, let me offer we might not use the word temperate to describe such people. And although it's not obvious, the Bible might not use the word self-controlled to describe such people. Now, before we have any mistakes or misunderstandings, I am not saying that any of those people in any of those situations are somehow, you can't be a Christian, you can't be godly. I'm not saying any of those things. It is possible to be a mature Christian who loves Chick-fil-A. So please don't hear me wrong. But what I am saying is that when we look at those six people, In our culture, what we look and value about them is they're passionate. We want people to be passionate about things. We want people to be focused, to be driven. And that's what our culture is shouting to us. And I'm simply offering from God's word that there is another quality, temperance and self-control, that the world is not shouting about, but God is quietly reminding us there is great value in temperance and in self-control. Which begs the question, well, what is temperance? What is self-control? Temperance, we would define this way. Being (laughs) self-controlled. 
Not that helpful, I get it. It means being level-headed. One Bible dictionary defines the Greek word that's used here, and I like, listen to the phrase, having no instances of mental or spiritual drunkenness. We often think of temperance going with actual alcohol, which of course it does. But it has to do with the idea, alcohol is when you're out of control. Temperance is the idea that in no mental area, no spiritual area, no emotional area, are we out of control? Are we being controlled by things outside of us? Being driven by passions or desires? 2 Timothy 4.5 describes or defines this word, keeping a level head in all situations. That's what the word temperance means. Its sister word, self-controlled, means to be in control of oneself. It's probably best defined by Titus 2, verse 11, sorry, verse 12, which we've been saying all year in our benediction. The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled lives. Self-controlled is not being driven by worldly passions. Now let me say up front again, there's nothing wrong with being passionate as long as you are passionate about the right things. Paul says in Galatians 4, they're zealous and that's great, we love zeal as long as you are zealous for the right things. God says, look, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Jesus says zeal for God's house ought to consume us. He says we should hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's passion. That's a good thing. But Titus says being self-controlled is not being controlled by passions for worldly things, meaning stuff of this world. And it's possible that the person who loves Chick-fil-A is actually being controlled by certain passions for food. You can be controlled by passions for a sports team. You can be controlled by passions and desires to see your kids live out your desires for them. You can be too passionate and too controlled, too driven by money, by work, by getting into the right school or having the right experiences. You can be driven by passion to be successful, to be accepted, to be loved by somebody. You can be driven by passions for sex, for food, for comfort, for travel. To be self-controlled is just not to be driven by those passions, not to be controlled by those cravings, not to be controlled by those desires. Which of course raises the question, how do you know if you're self-controlled? How do you know if you're temperate? See, one of the problems with self-control is we are all sure we have it. We think it's the guy who shaves his body and paints himself maize and blue, who stands up screaming at every Michigan football game. That's the guy without self-control, not us. We think it's the person who has or drinks five cups of coffee a day and drives all over the city just to find the right brew of coffee. That person is the one without self-control. We're good. We think the person who uses their phone just one more hour a day than we do, that's the one that's out of control. Ours is good. We do that, don't we? We think, oh yeah, well those parents, they travel all the way to St. Louis for their travel team. We don't do that. We only go to Detroit. That's the out of control one. We're under control. And so the problem with temperance and self-control is we think everybody else has got the problem and not us. So how do you know? How do you know if self-control and temperance is a problem? Well, let me say, that's the wrong way to ask the question. And you're like, well, you're the one who's telling us to ask the question that way. Yes, I've set you up. I don't want us to think about it that way. What I want us to think about it as, from a positive point of view, 
God's promise is you can have more self-control. And whether or not your Chick-fil-A eating or your University of Michigan fandom or your work or your money or your coffee or your technology use, whether or not those things are out of control or not, I don't know. You might not know. The good news is it doesn't matter. In each of those areas, if you would like more control, if you would like more temperance, more self-control, that's what God is offering here. You see, Titus 2 is not a rebuke passage. It's not a passage in which God is angry at us. And I don't think the point this morning is to think, "Uh uh-oh, God is mad at me because my life is out of control. Please hear me correctly. God sees that life itself is out of control. And the blessing of being under control, the blessing about not being driven by desires and passions and cravings, God is offering that to us through his Holy Spirit by Jesus' grace. And so the question this morning is not, am I okay or am I not okay? The question is, would you like more temperance in your life? Would you like more control? Would you like more self-control in your life? It's interesting, this, these things are commanded or talked about in reference to older men. This is a group that you might have thought didn't need to be talked to about self-control and temperance. But God's point is, look, all people can grow in this. And if you look at your sports engagement, your engagement with your children, your engagement with food, how you're dealing with this virus that is all over the world today and how you're thinking about those things, money, and if you think, I would like more control. I would like to experience more of God's control in my life. The blessing is it's available. Which does raise the question I want us to think about. How? How do you grow in self-control? How do you become more temperate? Even if you're an older man and you think, you know what? There's a level of godliness and maturity that I have through these years of experience. How can you be more self-controlled, more temperate? One basic truth and one metaphor that goes with that truth. The basic truth is this, the key to growing in self-control. Offer yourselves to God. This is it, this is, and again, it may seem pretty simple. It may seem pretty basic, pretty straightforward. This is the essence of growing in self-control. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The irony of self-control is we get it by giving up control to God. That when we offer ourselves to God to say, God, here I am, I belong to you as a living sacrifice. To grow in self-control, we say to God, God, I'm yours. I belong to you. Many of us have done this. Many of us can remember specific points in our past, maybe recently, maybe in the distant past, in which we dedicated our lives to the Lord, in which we thought to ourselves, you know what? I belong to God, I'm his The reminder, and it's basic truth, but we all need to be reminded of it, is that as we again and again say to God, my life is yours. I am a sacrifice and I offer myself to you. That is what keeps us from being controlled by our passions, our cravings, our desires, our sinful flesh. The metaphor that goes with this is that God is our good shepherd. The reason we don't have to be passionate about making sure we get to eat what we want to eat is because God is passionate about that for us. That God leads us and guides us. That what God wants for us as our good shepherd is to take better care of us than we could take care of ourselves that God loves us, that God is near to us, that God is going to protect us, that God is with us. 
The reason why life can feel out of control, the reason why we don't embrace temperance is we think everything rides on our shoulders. We think we're responsible for getting into that school. We're responsible for our kids turning out a certain way. We're responsible for being financially independent. We're responsible for making sure that at work we're the excellent worker that's there. And the truth is, your life and my life, we gotta give them to God. He's responsible. He's responsible for what school we get into. He's responsible for how our children turn out. He's responsible for how our financial situation takes place. He's responsible for making sure we end up in green pastures besides still waters, full of contentment and joy. Having experienced and realized a far better future than we could have designed for ourselves. There is, of course, no greater example of this than what's going on in our world today. In the midst of this virus, in the midst of the fear, in the midst of, well, I didn't get to have, uh, I'm not gonna get to have graduation. These are painful things. You know, I think of the people at Rockford who worked all this time to be able to put on Mary Poppins and then got it canceled. I just think, oh, that's heartbreaking. You think about teachers that are like, what am I gonna do now? I'm supposed to do online teaching with, thir with third graders? Is that gonna work? How's that gonna happen? Life feels out of control, and that's not even to mention that, is it safe to go to the grocery store, and is the grocery store gonna have any cleaning products when I get there, and what about contact with other people? Here's the response. You and I have the opportunity to say to God today in the midst of this, my life is a living sacrifice, I belong to you. In life and in death in sickness and in health, and all the things that we go through in the future, with the economy, with the events of life, you and I have a choice to say to God, you're the shepherd, we're the sheep. Lead us to green pastures. God promises, I will prepare a table before you, a communion table, in the presence of your enemy, and your enemy happens to be a disease that you can't see, you can't fight, that you actually, you and I have no control over. God says, I do have control. I will anoint your head with oil. I will lead you to places where you can sit in green pastures and still waters. This is what he promises to do, and all we have to do is give our lives to him. Now listen, we already know he's redeemed us and bought us. We belong to him. But there is a specific action to say, God, I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my health. I'm giving you my economic future. I'm giving you all these things. Maybe you got a trip planned and you're like, I have no idea if this trip is. Let your good shepherd lead you where you're supposed to go. But you and I have to make the choice. And the choice is we can either give him our lives or we can try to run them ourselves. If you and I try to run our lives in the midst of what's going on in the world today, not only will life feel out of control, we will not have temperance, we will not have self-control. We will run out and buy every Clorox wipe we can ever get our hands on. <clears throat> We will have no contact with any person, even somebody who might be hurting a non-Christian who needs to hear the gospel from us. We will think, but I can't control this disease. I've got to stay away from them. The danger is, is people will look at us and say, they are passionate, driven, and focused on maintaining their lives. And please, the reason why it's temperance and self-control, we are taking necessary precautions. I'm preaching to a room that's got about 70 people in it. We are taking necessary precautions, but temperance and self-control says, God, we are doing this because you led us here. We've planned about three different services this week. We had one on Sunday that we planned, or it's on one on Monday that we started planning. And then Tuesday, the elders met and we said, well, well should we really do communion? You know, is that, a, is that really a temperate and self-controlled thing to do? And the elders met together and we prayed and we made the decision not simply based on what the CDC had to say, but we asked our good shepherd, do you want us to have communion or not? And we felt like he said yes. And so we've been trying all week to figure out how do we have communion? That's why it would have been a lot easier to just say, well, let's just not do communion this week. But our good shepherd led us to do communion. So we're doing communion this week. 
Likewise, when the governor said, we really don't want people to meet together in groups of more than 100 except for essential meetings, we didn't just say, well, the governor said it, we gotta do it. We got back together and said, Jesus, this is your church. This is your church. What do you want us to do? And we felt at that point, gathering together as the body of Christ is essential. And that there is a need in society and community for people not just to be protected from sickness, but also to be able to have interperson contact, to be able to be present with Jesus. Then the governor said, we are ordering people not to get together. We still didn't really cancel church on the basis of that. We got together again on Friday and said, Lord, this church is yours. If you want us to disobey the governor, we'll disobey. You're our shepherd. We're the sheep. We felt like we heard God say, no, do it the way we're doing it now, which is we're going to essentially cancel church, ask a smaller group to get together and ask people to meet together in their homes and do these things. I think there is no greater, more important quality going forward in this crisis than temperance and self-control. And if you and I give ourselves to God and say, I'm here as a living sacrifice. You can send me into places where there is sickness. If they need Jesus, I need to go. You can tell me to go and, 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 and meet with a shut-in or go and visit somebody who is sick or dying or experiencing difficult things. Whatever you want, Lord. I'm yours, you're my shepherd. I'm gonna trust you're gonna take me where you want me to go. All of this leads us to our time of communion. One of the reasons why I think uh, the Lord wants us to celebrate communion is when you think about germs and disease, like, well, what do I take into my body? Well, we're gonna take in bread and juice or Coke or water or orange juice or whatever it may be. And what I'd like you to do is if you're at home, now is the time to get bread or cup or however you want to do it. We're going to distribute elements. You're going to hand people each, just hold on, just like we normally do, just hold on to the piece of bread and hold on to the liquid thing uh, that you have. We're going to have a chance to sing together and worship, but while we're doing that, and whether you're holding Roman meal in your hand or a little cracker or whatever it is, just think, that's not really just sandwich bread or Coke or juice. It's a symbol of the body and blood of Christ. And that what you're gonna take into your body is far more powerful than any germs or any sickness or any struggles or any diseases. And the one who's in you is greater than everything else in the world. And as you hold that bread and you hold that cup, this is an opportunity. What you have in your hands is a symbol that Jesus was not controlled and driven by his worldly passions and his cravings and his desires. Instead, he said, not my will, but yours be done. And in the greatest act of self-control and temperance, he chose to die so that no matter what happens with this virus, those who believe in him will have eternal life. There is nothing that disease or death can do about that. And so while you hold this bread in this cup, God's asking you to give your life back to him, to place your life in those hands. In just a minute, I'll get back up and I'll lead us through the words of the institution and we'll take communion together. But let me pray and then we'll participate. Thank you so much for joining us for this podcast from Calvary Church. We hope this message has brought the light and hope of God's presence into your life, refreshing your soul for the journey the Lord has you on. If you have a spiritual need or would like to connect further with the work God is doing through Calvary Church, seek us out online at calvarygr.